So I've known uh, Paula for a number of years. I'm not going to tell you how many, but uh, she is a member of ITV Partners, and we're so glad to, um, to have her on our team. Paula is a strategic leader with a proven ability to create a company-wide vision and drive business results. She has a passion for working directly with entrepreneurs to implement strategies for growth and profitability. Paula has over two decades of management and consulting experience in small to mid-sized businesses across a broad range of functional areas, including sales, marketing, finance, accounting, operations, human resources, customer support, and business development. Paula is skilled at analyzing existing operations and implementing strategic processes and technologies to improve company performance. She believes that entrepreneurs often know what to do but lack the time or internal expertise to accomplish the task at hand. Paula will definitely tackle the project and drive it to completion. As Paula's already mentioned, um, or maybe she didn't, Paula is also a certified six disciplines coach, a management system for purpose-driven leaders of small to mid-sized companies. Six disciplines combines on-site business coaching, workshops, and collaborative software to close the gap between the future vision of a company and today's reality by engaging the hearts and minds of every employee in the organization and aligning actions. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, Jim. That was a great introduction. Who is that person? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure to be uh, Jim does a great job of running two organizations in addition to his uh, real job. So we appreciate his work for ITB Partners and also for Bing. And thank you for the opportunity to present for Bing today. The last time um, I presented was last year for Bing, and we did talk about strategic planning, which was part of um, the six disciplines program that I use with small businesses. So I appreciate you mentioning that. As Jim said, I work with small businesses, and one of the uh, businesses that I was a COO of for more than 10 years used a tool called Predictive Index, which we will talk about uh, in just a minute. And part of that is uh, pre-employment, but part of it is helping small businesses keep their employees engaged. And so our conversation today is decoding the engagement challenge, or as Richard has said, why do people leave good jobs? So I'm aiming this at individuals more than a management team, but we will talk about the employer side of things as we go forward as well. So as I mentioned, I've worked with small businesses since uh, mid-career, and at my last employer, we use Predictive Index for pre-employment. So I was trained as an internal consultant for Predictive Index, and used it personally for more than six years internal to the company for every position that we hired uh, in the Atlanta office and also assisted some of our small offices with um, pre-employment. Um, as I said, it's a wonderful tool. We had, interestingly enough, all of our salespeople, which were commercial real estate brokers, profiled nationally by revenue generation. So we had a very good feel for what personality types were best, not only just within the company, but even divided by large office versus small office. So Atlanta was a larger office for that company, and we knew what the best profile was for us. And as I mentioned, I helped some of the smaller offices. We knew what the best profile was for them. So I have um, knowledge of predictive index, not just as an external consultant, but internal to a company. After I left that position, I was tapped by Predictive Index to become an external consultant, and I really have appreciated the opportunity to bring this tool, this resource to small businesses so that they make better hiring decisions, but also can keep their existing employees engaged and productive within the company. So we're calling this the presentation, uh, Decoding the Engagement Challenge. I would like to tell you that Predictive Index is a 60 plus year old company and this behavior profile that they offer has uh, had more than 350 validity tests 
over the years. So it is very good, as it suggests, predictor of employee performance. More recently, they've added a cognitive um, assessment as well. And between the two of those, um, they've increased the ability to make good hiring decisions. I love the company because their mission is better work, better world. And we all know that if we're happy at work, we're generally happier at home too. So it's very important to, uh, as Richard has already indicated, select a company that's a good fit for your particular situation. Predictive Index has coined the term talent optimization in the last couple of years, and you can actually go to talent optimization.org, which is a nonprofit website that they've put up and uh, become trained or more skilled in talent optimization. And the way that we look at it is that we know every company or hopefully every company has a business strategy and they're trying to um, achieve certain business results, but they have to do it through people. And the way to do that is first design the organization so that you have the positions to achieve the business results that you would like, hire appropriately for those positions, and then once you have good employees, keep them connected to the company, which by the way was a lot easier prior to COVID and working virtually than it is now. And so one of the other opportunities that Predictive Index provides for small businesses is to diagnose when employee engagement is not what they would like for it to be. Um, there's an assessment tool for that and some diagnostic capabilities um, through the Predictive Index resources. I love this diagram of a total person. When we, um, Richard and, and Jim, you're helping people look for jobs and the first thing that everybody does is look at their LinkedIn profile, the employer looks at it. We, as employees we're, or, or workers, we're trying to make our LinkedIn profile look really good so we'll attract the right employers. We um, have our resumes and the company interviews us to make sure that we have the skills and the experience that they're looking for for a particular position. So we say that these things, your, your experience and your knowledge can change over time. You can get additional experience, um, take different positions, learn how to be a better manager, et cetera. But we also know that you have certain innate drives or needs as a person. And that's what the behavior assessment from PI and the cognitive assessment attempt to uh, profile for different positions. But we also know that the whole person shows up at work. And that includes how you feel, what's your, what's your heart, what is it that you really want out of life, and what kind of culture, company culture, do you thrive in? So I love that this, uh, this total person shows up at work, and that's the behavior that we see from employees at work when you combine not only their skills and experience, but their needs and their drives and their values. So what is engagement? It's, it's back when we were at 3% unemployment, engagement was a bigger topic than it is right now because people were really vying for talent. Companies were vying for talent. And engagement can really uh, point the way to success or failure for people within an organization. So our definition for this presentation is the emotional commitment to the company and its goals. And that's being all in. That's being, I love this company, I love my team, I'm so excited to be here every day. And I think that's what all employees really want uh, is to find that kind of position. So we, we join a company, Richard, as you said, we, we look at a company and we think we found a position that we want and we really want to be on that upper track with that company. We really want to be a good employee. We really want to perform well. Sometimes there's forces of disengagement that can make us not uh, stay on that trajectory, that green trajectory of, of doing better and better at the company. And sometimes that might be the job fit. You're not particularly a good fit for that particular position. It might be your manager. It might be the culture of the company. 
or it could be the team that you're on. And we're going to talk about these four factors of disengagement. What we don't want either as a manager or as an employee is to have to. I have to go to work. I don't like it. I don't like my boss, but I just have to go to work. So we know that that's an expensive endeavor for companies when we have employees that are disengaged. And it's no surprise that employees that are disengaged uh, have higher absenteeism. Um, they leave companies. Uh, they're not as productive. So under any set of circumstances, disengaged employees are expensive for companies and also for individuals. So to, to de decode this engagement challenge, we have to look at the workplace, the individual, and these work environment pressures. So we're gonna take each one of these four factors and dive a little bit uh, deeper into them. And then at the end, we will take um, any questions that you may have about this. I don't wanna make you a predictive index expert, but to explain how we can make better choices, I have to give you a little uh, insight into what the predictive index behavior assessment actually measures. And it measures four factors, dominance, extroversion, patience, and formality. And it measures these factors on a scale from low to high. So everything is relative. So you'll notice that uh, dominance is, we call it the A vitamin, extroversion, the B vitamin, patient C, and formality or need for rules and details um, is the D vitamin. And if I give someone the behavior assessment, you will rank on the scale either from low to high. So in the example I've put up on the screen, if you see the top line slices into the dominant line on the right hand side of the midpoint, this is someone with high dominance. This is also someone with higher extroversion. This is somebody that's very quick to connect with people. You'll notice that patience is lower. Um, it's on the left-hand side, so it's considered low patience. Low patience is not a bad thing. In our society, we think that having patience is a good thing. <laughs> what comes to mind right now is, since it's almost Halloween, is Karen. We all know Karen. The one, <laughs> the, uh, I've heard that's one of the most popular Halloween costume right now is Karen, the woman who didn't have patience and asked to speak for the man to the manager, right? Um, but, but low patients can also mean that you have a higher drive to get things done. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to have low patients. And then on the formality scale, there's some people that need a lot of rules and want to know, want boundaries and want to know where they stand. But in this particular instance, um, the formality is to the left-hand side. So they're more flexible than someone who would have high formality. 